All right, let's um, take some time then to look at tissues. As I said before, in this handout that we're using, we have histology at the top of the list, the, the title of this, and histology is the study of tissues. Now, when most people think of tissues, they think of a group of cells. But you and I need to begin to think that, yes, it is a group of cells, but it's more than that. Okay, how is a tissue more than that? Well, think of it this way. Tissues are groups of cells, but also products that the cells produce. In many tissues, we see an accumulation of material okay, that is an essential part of the tissue but isn't a living cell. Best example of that would be bone. If you look at a skeleton, you see bones that are created out of bone tissue. Well, those bones are not mostly cells. They're mostly stuff. They're mostly material. Now, where did that material come from? It wasn't, didn't just come from the food you eat. Yes, the raw materials for the bones comes from the food you eat, but the bone tissue, that material itself, is made by the cells. So tissues are groups of cells, but the tissue also includes any materials, substances, any stuff that the cells make that accumulate to be part of that tissue. Now that non-cellular part of the tissue is defined by the word matrix. Make sure you have firmly in mind the concept of the word matrix. It is all the stuff that makes up the tissue beside the cells. Hey, everybody got that basic idea? That's what a matrix is. Now, when you think of tissues, you're going to recognize that there are some tissues that have a lot of matrix and some tissues that have very little. There's, there's quite a variety of proportions here. Bone, for instance, is a tissue with a lot of matrix. The majority of the tissue is matrix. There are still living cells. When you look at a bone, you don't think, oh, that's just a dead object like a rock. No, the, a bone is full of bone cells. But the majority of the tissue is the matrix of the bone tissue. Now contrast that maybe with something like muscle. If you look at muscle, muscle is kind of flexible, it's squishy, it's mostly cells. It's like 99% cellular. What makes up muscle tissue are muscle cells. So there's this spectrum, isn't there? There's this broad range of tissues from some that are mostly matrix to some that are mostly cells. And we're going to recognize that as we go along. Okay, questions, we good with that? Okay, so we, we must start with that basic concept of the matrix as part of the tissue. It's not just a group of cells. Now when we look at the number of different kinds of cells, we said there are about 200 and something different cells in the human body. And they make up a smaller number of tissues but it's, it's in that hundreds range, not you know millions and thousands. When we look at all the different kinds of tissues in the human body, scientists have basically then categorized all of these tissues in four major categories, and you see them listed on your handout. So our next thing to do is I want us to just have a basic understanding 
of what each one of the tissues are. These tissue, these four tissue types here. Let's look at some major characteristics. Think of the roles they play. Then later today, we will actually look at each one of these in detail and say how many different types or, you know, how do these break down. So we're going to start then with epithelial tissues. With epithelial tissues. What are epithelial tissues? Well, the best way to describe them is to talk about them as covering and protecting tissues. These are tissues that are found on the surfaces of the human body. Now when I say that, what tissue do you think of right away? Skin, right? Skin is covering and protecting the outside surface of my body. But you also need to realize that there are many internal surfaces to the human body that might not be so obvious to you. But there are, like, there are just tons of epithelial tissues. Can you think of what some internal surfaces might be? The digestive tract. You have a tube running through your body from your mouth to your anus. Can I say the word anus? Of course I can. Okay, you've got a tube running all the way through you. The inside of that is going to be lined with an epithelial tissue. Now, think too that these tissues then are going to be providing entrances and exits. I just was talking to you about the cell membrane, right? Being shipping and receiving. Nothing gets into or out of the cell, but it has to come through the cell membrane. Well, you know what? Nothing gets in or out you without coming through an epithelial tissue. The inside of you, your flesh, the substance of your body, is separated from the outside world by epithelial tissues. And anything, if your food gets into you, if oxygen is going to get into you, if waste products are going to get out, out of you, they have to cross an epithelial tissue. So everywhere, these are just all over the place within your human body. And many different types. The type of tissue that's going to let oxygen in and out of you is going to be a different type of tissue than lets food in and out of you which is going to be a different type of tissue than, say, the sweat of your body comes out of. If you're sweating, that's moisture from your body coming out through an epithelial tissue. So all of the entrances and exits from your body are through epithelial tissues. So epithelial tissues, there's many different kinds because there's many different roles to play. This outside skin of mine, is not meant to, to take things in and out. I don't digest food by laying it on my skin. Right? This is meant to keep the outside world out, all those microbes and things, and keep the moisture of my body in. If two-thirds of me is moisture, if I didn't have a skin here, I would dry up right away. Put a piece of chicken or a piece of meat out on the counter for you know half the day, and what is it? It's all dried up, isn't it? Right? It's going to take several days to rot, but the first thing that's going to happen if you leave it out on the counter for very long, it's going to get hard and crusty because the water is going to evaporate out of it. Without your skin, the water would evaporate out of you. You'd be some human jerky. Okay? So every epithelial tissue is specialized to do a certain thing. You don't have to worry about losing moisture down deep inside your body. Right? There isn't a lot of place to just evaporate water out into. But there are other things to, you know, there's other reasons to have epithelial tissues, and mostly it's to draw things in or out of you. <clears throat> now, all epithelial tissues have the b same basic structure to them. Now, think of things, now don't think anatomy right now, don't think human body, but think in your everyday world, if you're going to cover something, what kinds of objects, what kinds of things do you use to cover things in your everyday world? If you want to protect them, 
What? Okay, plastics, like sheets of plastic, right? Maybe I have a plastic cover for my barbecue. All right, what else? Just some everyday things that cover and protect things. Clothes, right? Clothing, right? Cars, parts. Oh, okay, I wasn't thinking so much. Yeah, that would be a protection. Bars don't really cover. They kind of let you still see through. Thinking of something that, that covers. You're in the protecting realm, though. What? Yeah, a house maybe, in a sense. Thinking of more everyday sorts of things, like a tablecloth, right, a car cover, sheets on your bed, clothing, Right? All of these have the same basic structure to them, don't they? What are they? They're sheet-like, aren't they? Right? All of these things we're describing that we use to cover things are sheet-like, aren't they? They're very, very thin. Right? And how many sides are there, like on a bed sheet? How many sides on a bed sheet? It's not a trick question. There's two sides on the sheet, isn't there? There's, there's edges. There are edges to it, but there's just basic two, two sides, right? When you put the sheet on your bed, you know which side to put up and which side to put down, right? Or if you put a tablecloth on the table, one side is usually nice and decorative, and the other side maybe is not so much, right? There's definitely two sides to all of these things. Um, you could think of this like um, if I took... Maybe I took a tablecloth and I glued it onto the table. One side of the tablecloth gets glued, and the other side becomes the new surface of the table, doesn't it? Right? Understand what I'm saying? That's how these epithelial tissues are working. They're glued, in a sense, quote, glued onto the surfaces of your body, and they become the new surface. So you can picture these both outside and inside. Picture them running through your digestive tube. Picture these running down into your lungs. Um, the females that are in here, picture your reproductive organs, your vagina, your uterus, your fallopian tubes. All of those passageways are lined with epithelial tissues. All of the little tubes in a male's reproductive system. All the little tubes all the way up into his testes are all lined. All, you, all the tubes in your kidneys are lined. The tubes coming out of your kidneys. Your urinary bladder is lined with an epithelial tissue. The urethra that leads from your bladder out of your body, either through a penis in a male or through your vulva in a female, all of that tube is lined. Your respiratory tracts, all the breathing tubes are lined. Epithelial tissues are everywhere in the human body, tons of them. Because there's lots and lots of places that things need to get out and in. This would include, two surface glands. And this could be, when I say surface, I just mean on the surface. This would be like sweat glands or oil glands on your skin. But it could also be like the glands down in your intestinal tract that produce enzymes or acids for digestion. You have glands down in there. Any gland that leads to the surface of the body has little tubes that lead to one of the surfaces, internal or external, are epithelial tissues. Now, what's the basic structure of this? Well, we said these are flat. You want to sort of picture them like this. They have a dense cellular structure. Epithelial tissues are made out of densely packed cells. In the picture that you see here, the cells here are covering some other tissues. This gray down here is some other tissue of the human body. This pink part here are groups of cells. You can see their nuclei. They're all packed tightly together. You can see that there's sort of a layer of glue right here as well. Uh, when we speak of that part that sort of glues the cells down, we speak of something called a basement membrane. You want to be able to say that every epithelial tissue will have a free surface and a basement membrane. Basically, these are the two sides of the tissue. 
If the tissue is like a sheet, if it has two sides to it, when the tissue is glued down to protect and cover the other elements here, one side of the tissue becomes the new free surface, and the other side you will see a layer of gluey stuff, which is what is referred to as the basement membrane. It's not really a membrane, but it, was, it could be seen early on in microscopic investigation, and it looked like a layer there. It looked like a membrane to the people that were describing it, and so they described it as that. Today we know it isn't literally a membrane. It's just kind of a layer of gluey type substance, uh, part of the matrix here that holds the cells to the tissue underneath. So this, this is the basic structure of all epithelial tissues. They're all going to be densely packed cells. There's some real advantages to this too then because we can program the cells to allow certain things into your body and prevent other things. Rather than your body having a, just like a physical wall or a barrier between the outside world and the inside world, Right? We have a set of living cells that can perform certain functions that can allow some things but disallow other things. Um, an analogy here would be we've got a brand new president. You know, think about how you protect a president. Right? You can protect a president in a, you know, a bulletproof building or a bulletproof car. But when the president is in something like that, he can't interact with other people very well. If he goes out, like on the parade route, he got out of the car several times yesterday and went out and shook people's hands and stuff like that. What happens when he goes out to do that? Is there any protective barrier around him? Yes. What is the protective barrier when he gets out to go shake some hands? Secret service, right. Those, he's got a group of people around him, living beings who can look for specific threats. If somebody comes at him in a threatening way, they can do something about that. If his daughter comes running at him out of the crowd, they let, him through, let her through, right? So those, peop, those people are different than just the walls of a building or an automobile, right? The barriers in your human body are living active structures that can make decisions about what comes into you and what doesn't. Okay? So you want to see, it's important to see that the boundaries in my body are living and active structures, not, not just physical walls. Okay? Uh, a last major characteristic that we would give you here is the term avascular. These tissues are avascular. Now, if you know, we'll give you a little Latin lesson if you don't know this yet. The word vascular is in here, like in the word cardiovascular. Right? Do you know the word, what the word vascular means? Do you? Yes? It has to do with circulatory. What part of the circulatory? If it's cardiovascular, cardio is heart, vascular is vessels, tubes, right? My cardiovascular system is a heart pumping blood through tubes. Vascular means tubes. I, I think immediately of like arteries and veins. Now, if the letter A is put in front of it in Latin, what does that mean? Absence of, not that thing, without that. So when you see avascular, that means there's no blood vessels here. And basically, the tissue is thin enough that there isn't any room for them. But the second question would then be, how do these cells live if they don't have any blood supply? Where do you think the blood supply is? It's in the tissue underneath that they're covering and protecting. See, we get a symbiotic sort of relationship here, right? These cells cover and protect these other tissues, and the other tissues then nourish the epithelial tissue. You may have noticed this. If you ever cut your finger, maybe a paper cut where you didn't bleed, you could see that there was a literal you know, slice in your skin, but you didn't bleed because it didn't go deep enough. 
or maybe in grammar school, do any, any of you ever take a straight pin and stick it through a little bit of skin on your finger? And the little pin was hanging on there. Oh, I got a pin in my finger. Ew. Right? Scare the girls or you know, whatever it was. But right? You just, you, if you just kind of got that right through the epith- just through the epithelial tissue, as long as you didn't press down into the other tissues underneath where the blood vessels were, you didn't bleed. And you could kind of feel it because the closer the nerve endings are down in here too, the closer you get to this, the more you feel. But as, as long as you're in these epithelial layers, then you don't bleed because there's no blood vessels in the epithelial tissues themselves. But they're so thin, and they're right on top of tissues that typically have lots of blood vessels, that there is that sort of symbiotic relationship. So that's, this, is, this is the big picture of epithelial tissues. Later today, we're going to talk about the different types that there are. But we just want to start with this basic concept. We good there? Got the idea? Okay, let's let's turn our attention to the second set of tissues. These are called connective tissues. Connective tissues. Now, in many ways, these are the opposite of what we think of as epithelial tissues. These are not on the surfaces of the body. These are down inside you. And many of them do what the name says. Many of these tissues literally do hold you together. Like you've got this whole skeleton of bones. How do all of these bones stay together? Well, there's connective tissues holding them together. There's connective tissues holding the muscles to the bones. Many organs in your human body need coverings and things around them that hold them together. This this group of tissues would also include, though, the support tissues in the human body. Okay, the skeleton, for instance... Parts of the skeleton, like bone and cartilage, we include here. So actually, this this group is a little broader than just connective, the name connective. And, you know, as I said, there's no free surfaces here. The real key to this tissue, to understanding the structure of this tissue, is to know that these tissues are mostly matrix. Got that? Mostly matrix. It turns out, as you might guess, that cells are kind of just these little soft protoplasmic stuff. They're not very strong in and of themselves. They're they're not made to be strong. They're made to be these little manufacturing structures. Are these little coordinated, organized bits of manufacturing. So how do I get strength? How do I get things to hold my body together? My cells manufacture materials that hold me together. And other materials that build the skeleton of my body, the structure of my body. You tell... Since most of the tissue is matrix, you identify these tissues by their matrix, not so much by the cells. The cells don't have a lot of variety to them. Most of the cells here look pretty much the same. But because the majority of the tissue is the matrix, when you look at it, you say, oh, this is bone tissue, or this is cartilage tissue, or this is, this is the connective tissue that holds muscles to the body. This is a tendon or a ligament. These tissues um, are both vascular and avascular. They're sort of a mix. Some of these tissues have rich blood supplies to them, and some do not. Uh, An example here would be bone. Bone is very, very vascular. There is a lot of blood in a bone. You break a major bone, and you can bleed profusely. Um, Sometimes uh, in, say, a car accident, if somebody breaks both their thigh bones, you can actually bleed to death. 
by breaking two bones because they're big bones and they're just full of blood. Um, other tissues like cartilage, uh, people damage cartilage, say, in their knee. It almost never heals because it does not have a rich blood supply. There's very little um, blood vessel associated with cartilage. So typically when it breaks or something, it doesn't heal very well. You just go in and you take out the parts that are broken and leave what's there there. But it doesn't repair itself well because there, there isn't a good blood supply to it. Of, of the four categories that we're looking at, this is the one that has the, the broadest range of types. There are, there are more different kinds of tissues in this category than any of the others. And basically what we do is we use this mostly matrix idea here, and any of the tissues in the body that are mostly matrix are all lumped here in this category. And a little bit later today, we'll look at all the different types there are here. Okay, the last um, couple of tissues. The third major tissue type that's here are the muscular tissues. Muscular tissues. Now, when you think of muscle, you immediately think of, say, the muscle in your skeleton, like the poster on the wall over here. But there are actually three different types of muscles in you. And all these tissues, any of the three types, their major characteristic is that they have a contractile movement. The cells have built within themselves. Every cell is a factory, and a muscle cell is a factory, but this, the muscle cell builds within itself special organelles that can actually shorten. They can use ATP energy to make themselves shorter. And that creates movement. And everything I do is muscular. We don't often think this. You know, you don't think that everything I do, maybe thinking really isn't muscular if I'm thinking about something, but if I do something, you know, communication becomes so natural to us that I think sometimes we, we don't stop and think, it's all muscular. There are muscles contracting to force air out. There are muscles in my vocal areas contracting to make the vocal cords a certain size so they make certain sounds. I've got muscles in and through my throat, my mouth, my tongue, my lips that are forming the sounds that are coming out. There's a, there's a huge coordination of muscular activity for me to be able to speak intelligently so that you can understand that. Everything that I do, if I couldn't move a muscle, you would know nothing about me. You would know nothing about me as a person. I could not communicate or do anything in any way if I could not move a muscle. When a person is laying in a bed with their eyes open or whatever, if they can't move a muscle, we don't know what's going on with them. And we can monitor brain waves to see if they're awake or asleep or whatever. But, you know, some people can only blink their eyes, and they use their eyes to blink yes or no or something. Everything I do is muscular, and muscle tissues are at the heart of that. All muscle tissues sort of have a fibrous structure to them. They have sort of these long, stringy kinds of cells, and, and they're sort of long and stringy so that then they shorten. They, they make their length shorter. This is one of those tissues that is a dense cellular structure, kind of like the epithelial tissues. The tissue is 99% cells. And we said there are three types. Well, we'll go into those three types a little bit later. <clears throat> okay, let's look at the last tissue then. The fourth category of tissues in the human body are the nerve tissues. And by that, we, we're talking about your brain, your spinal cord, and then all the nerves that course through your human body. All of this makes up something we call the nervous system. 
um, nerve tissues are responsible for all of the control functions in your human body. All of your thinking processes. This is really where you live in these tissues. Who you are, your personality, your, your likes, your dislikes, your emotions, your personality. All of that is somehow within the function of nerve tissue. Nerve tissue is very different from the other types. In each of the other three types, we talk about a single sort of cell and any products that those cells produce. In nerve tissue, we have something different. We actually have a blend of different cells all in one tissue. The tissue itself is a mixture or a blend of different kinds of cells. It's one thing. We actually don't have different types of nerve tissue. We just have nerve tissue. It's one thing. But it's this very, very intricate blend of different types of cells. The two types of, there's two types of cells that are in here. And they are neurons. You remember neuron was one of the eight cells you were studying for the quiz. And glial cells. Glial cells are thought of as support cells. These are cells that help the neurons do what they do. Again, a, a sort of governmental concept here helps us understand this. You want to think of nerve tissues in the human body like the government of the human body the control structures of the human body, the, the parts of the, that guide and direct the activities of the human body. Um, if, if the nerve tissue is the government, the neurons are the decision makers. These are the actors. These would be like the congressmen and the senators and the president and the vice president. All the major people that make the decisions. They say this is how it's going to be and this is how it's going to be. Right? The glial cells are like all of those people that help them do what they do. Every senator and congressman is going to have a whole host of aides. And those people are going to do everything from bringing them breakfast and lunch to getting their clothes clean to doing a lot of the little everyday responsibilities so that they can focus on meeting with people and making decisions. You know, think of, of the president and how many people it takes to run the White House. Something like 90 or 100 people all together that keep the White House humming. Everything from people that help out in the Oval Office to people that clean and cook meals and all the other things that get done. The glial cells here are, are like those support cells. Um, in terms of the nerve tissue, these nourish and support and insulate. A lot of the chemical, electrochemical activity here is a lot like the wiring in a building. And in modern building practices, all the wiring we put in a building is insulated. So these support cells have these various roles to play. And it's, it's about a 10 to 1 ratio. You had, just like it would be in a government, you've got many more aides than you actually have congressmen and senators. You know, you've got 10 times as many glial cells as you have neurons. Typical, typically, too, when you hear about somebody, say, with brain cancer, like if you were following the news yesterday, um, Senator Kennedy has brain cancer. Brain cancer isn't in the neurons, typically. It's in these support cells. This is where most brain cancers start. Yes? Um, the general term for them are glial. There are different types. That's a, yeah. The, the technical name, too, is neuroglial cells, but we typically shorten it to just say glial cells. But the ones that are act... In a, in a nourishing role are different from the ones that act as support cells, are different from the ones that act as insulators. So there are many different types of glial cells, but that's kind of just the general name for all of the support type cells and the nerve tissues, or the nerve tissue. I should use a singular on that. Okay? So these are the major tissues of the human body. We good with that? All right.
Okay. So we're going to take a 